All right, 1 John chapter 1. So 1 John chapter 1 is a little easier chapter to read than Matthew 27. <laughs> I was laughing. I was going to take three weeks to get through Matthew 27, but I just couldn't get myself to ask Brother Ryan to read it one more time. It's so long. But 1 John chapter 1 is going to be our, our focus this evening. Please keep your place there. We'll be coming back to that. But we're talking about good things in the Bible, right? So we talked about, last week we talked about repentance. Look, repentance is a good thing in the Bible. Repentance has been, you know, the meaning of repentance has been ruined by, you know, false prophets, heretics, people that, you know, talk about, you know, repenting of your sins being necessary for salvation. But repentance itself, turning, changing your mind is necessary for salvation. You must change your mind from what you believe before to, you know, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw that repentance is a good thing that has been tainted by bad people. So this morning, or this evening, I'm sorry, what I want to talk about is confessing your sins. I want to talk about confessing your sins. This is another thing that is a good thing in the Bible. The Bible talks about here in 1 John, look down at verse number 9, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So look, Let's, first of all, we're going to read the whole thing in context, but the problem here is that people use this verse and other verses in the Bible to actually tie confession of your sins to salvation. Okay, so this evening I want to talk to you about, you know, confessing your sins being a good thing, what this verse means, and then just talk about what that means for our, you know, Christian life. Okay, so first of all, as with any verse in the Bible that somebody takes, you know, and just they take that one verse and they just run a thousand miles with it, it many times, if you just look at the few verses before and the few verses after, you can figure out what's going on. So let's just take the whole thing in context. Look back at verse number six of 1 John chapter one. So we're talking about confessing our sins. It's a good thing. But we know, we know that it's not tied with salvation. So let's see if we can figure out what 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9 means. Okay, Look at verse number 6. We'll do a little bit of a Bible study before we get into the application of the sermon. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So look, if you look at verse number 8, first of all, if you look at verse number 8, we kind of have a Proverbs moment here. We kind of have verse number 8 and verse number 9 are kind of opposites here. It's basically saying, hey, in verse number 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So basically it says if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Okay, you're not telling the truth. But then you see the opposite side of that coin in verse number 9. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we see that, look, it's about, so that confessing your sins, it's about admitting sins, okay? It's about admitting your sin, and it's the opposite of saying you have no sin, That's right. okay, in verse number 8. And then it says in verse number 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So look, if you say that you have not sinned, you say you have no sin, that, you know, the Bible is saying there that you have made yourself a liar, and you've made God a liar. Because the Bible says that all have sinned, right? So look, this is about, verse number 6 really gives us the context of what the few verses below are talking about. It says, if we say that we have fellowship in Him. Okay, so this is about being in fellowship with the Lord, is what this is talking about. It's about being in good standing, in good standing with your Heavenly Father. Turn to Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32. If you open up the center of your Bible, right in the middle, you'll be in the book of Psalms, and go to Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32. The Bible talks a lot about this. The Bible talks a lot about, you know, confessing your sins or admitting your sins. Look at Psalm chapter 32 and look at verse number 5. The Bible says, it says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. He's talking to God. And mine iniquity have I not hid. I mean, so there's the opposite again right? He's like, I acknowledge my sin. I've not hid it. So 
So I've acknowledged it, I've not hid it. So the opposite of confessing your sin is hiding your sin. Okay? I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So to confess, we see, is to acknowledge. Go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We see another verse here. Actually, you go to Proverbs 28, and I'll just read for you Acts chapter 19 and verse number 18. Go to Proverbs 28. The book right after Psalms is Proverbs. Acts chapter 19, look at verse number 18. The Bible reads, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And look at Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13. Now this is really, I mean, the conclusion of the matter right here is summed up very nice in Proverbs 28 and verse number 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But, now here's Proverbs, right? Proverbs is, is constantly, do it this way, not this way. Do it like this, or this will happen. I mean, it's talking about, constantly talking about the opposites. He that covereth his sins shall not prof prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Okay? Now look, it's, it's basically talking about covering versus confessing. All right? So look, does it say that he that covereth his sins shall burn in hell? Is that, what, is that what that says? Does it say, he that covereth his sins, you know, shall, you know, die the second death and have his name removed from the book of life? I mean, is that what it says here? No, it just says that you shall not prosper. It's talking about having fellowship with your heavenly Father. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Because look, you want to, I mean, it's not, I mean, we got saved, right? And now we got adopted into God's family. I mean, the Bible teaches us about having a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. I mean, thank God that He has given us that information. I mean, I don't want to get saved and then just, you know, train wreck my life. I mean, who would want to do that? So God gives us direction throughout the entire Bible on how to keep a good relationship with Him. I mean, does being saved, look, I mean, being saved has nothing to do with what you do. It has nothing to do with what you did. It has nothing to do with what you do in your life. So. You could either do well after you get saved or not do well. And the, and the difference is your relationship with your heavenly Father at that point. Okay? Look at Hebrews 12 and, and look at verse number 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof ye are all partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It's saying, look, if you're enduring chastisement of God, that means it's because you're saved. It's because you've been adopted into that family. He's like, where you really have to worry is the person that doesn't endure any chastisement. They're just messing up and sinning, and there's no chastisement there. It's like, they're not sons. That's why. Because those people, you know, God's not going to chastise those people. That's why, that's why wicked people can get away. You're like, why in the, do all these wicked people just get away with all this stuff? Because they're just not going to deal with the chastisement of God like you are. That's why. They're going to pay in hell. Yeah. I mean, if they die unsaved, they're going to pay for eternity in hell. That's right. All right? But you are going to endure the chastisement of God in your life right. on this earth. Furthermore... We have had fathers of our flesh with corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? He's saying, look, your father that corrected you, your, your dad in your real life that corrected you, look, they did that because they loved you. I mean, you spank your kids because you love them. You chastise your children because you love them. I mean, the Bible says you literally hate them if you don't. All right, so the Bible here is saying how much more would this apply with your heavenly Father? So look, there's a relationship here. There's a relationship here that can either be in good standing or not in good standing. I mean, don't forget that as you walk through this Christian life. It's the same thing. For verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So why 
why would God, I mean, why would God have to chasten us? God has to chasten us because we still have sin. Because we still have the flesh. We're still doing things wrong. Just because you got saved doesn't mean now you're perfect. No, you will have this flesh as long as you live on this earth. Until you've been given a glorified body, which is not going to happen while you're living on this earth. Look, there has to be some mechanism, some methodology that you know, a sinner has in the Bible to live in harmony with the Lord. And that is what the Bible is teaching us here. All right, now look. Does every, child, does every child get spanked constantly by their father, by their dad? I mean, does every child just get spanked like 10 times a day? No, I mean, some kids do. I mean, some of my kids, I thought, were just enjoying that for a while in their life. But I was like, maybe they like it. I don't know. But I'm still going to do it. But here's the thing. Not every child, because some children figure out, and they will eventually, trust me, parents of young children, they will eventually figure out how to be in good standing with you. And then you won't have to spank them ten times a day. You know, you won't have to chasten them. So look, it is about obtaining mercy from your heavenly Father. It's about, look at verse number 11 again. In verse number 11 of Hebrews 12, it says, yielded the peaceable fruit. It's about living in peace with your heavenly Father. It is not about salvation. Okay? There, look, there is nothing that even indicates that in the Bible. All right? People, and look, people must be so confused that believe that. You say, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but I'm going to become unsaved if I don't forgive my brother or if I don't confess my sins or all these different things. And look, it's, it's very, very confusing people that add confession to salvation. Amen. You know, i.e. Catholics i.e. Lutherans. I mean, this is what they do with confession. They add it to salvation. They add that work. By, by the way, that's a work. That's a work that you do, all right, is confession. Now, look, one of my favorite things to do is go and find out Catholic doctrine from Catholics. So I go to, whenever I go to Catholic, you know, uh, I want to find out Catholic doctrine, I go to Catholic.com or I go to catholicanswers.com. But here is an example of people and some doctrine from the Catholic Church that has taken this verse out of context and applied it to salvation. And I'm going to show you how confusing it can be for people. Look, I was raised Lutheran. I know how confusing it is. It's very confusing. Every Catholic, every Lutheran, if they're, if they're thinking this through, they're confused. I guarantee you. All right, here, from catholic.com. This is talking about your sins and how they're forgiven, all right? If you believe, I mean, look, if, you've read, you've, if you're saved, someone has read you the Bible where it says, hey, it's not of works, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a done deal, just like that. And it's forever, you're sealed by the Holy Ghost, no one can break that. From Catholic.com. Our, this is a question, are all of our sins, past, present, and future, forgiven once and for all when we become Christians? They never say saved, by the way, and I'll explain that why. They won't use that terminology, and I'll explain that in a minute. Not according, they, it continues, not according to the Bible or the early church fathers. First of all, which one? Which one? Yeah. which one are we listening to, the Bible or the church fathers? Because the church fathers said a lot of different things. Okay, so pick one, first problem, okay? But that's not even the point. Scripture, they continue, Scripture nowhere states that our future sins are forgiven. Oh, really? Because every single one of my sins was a future sin when Jesus died on the cross. You already make no sense. All right? They continue. Scripture nowhere states that our future sins are forgiven. Instead, it teaches us to pray and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. This is their quote. That means... The, mean, the means, I'm sorry, by which God forgives sins after, bab after baptism is confession. I'm going to read that again. The means by which God forgives sins after baptism is confession. So right there they say the means that God uses, the method that God uses to forgive sins after baptism is confession. So basically, you have to think of it this way. All right, I'm going to just try to explain this because you're already confused. I can see it in your faces. All right, you have a bucket that's all your sins in your life. 
Okay? Let's say we have a five gallon bucket from Home Depot and it's got all the sins that you will ever commit in your life in that bucket. The Catholic here, Catholic.com is saying, he is saying that the sins after you are baptized are not covered by Christ. They are covered by you confessing them. Which is interesting because 99.9% .9 of Catholics are baptized as a baby. So what you're telling me is, is that, I mean, I was baptized as a baby. Baptized by, as a baby. So what I'm saying is that, what they're saying is that none of my sins in my entire life are covered by Christ. That is heresy. That is wicked heresy. And that is not what the Bible teaches. They are not only adding works to salvation, but they are disrespecting and blaspheming the blood of Christ. It's crazy. I mean, did Jesus die only for certain sins? Let's look at what the Bible says. I mean, here's the thing. You, I mean, go to 1 John chapter 2. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to go off on this for three hours, but I could. Basically, if you were baptized in the Catholic Church as a baby, and I, I, I say baptized in quotes here, none of your sins are covered by Christ. But look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, are you there? Look at verse number 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of what? The whole world. I mean, look. The, sin, look, the sins of the whole world were paid for by Christ. And all people have to do is accept that gift by trusting on Christ. That's it. If they want their sins covered by Christ. So look, propitiation means appeasement. It means that the wrath was appeased. The wrath was, It means to bring a state of peace. And so you say, why, why, why did a, a, a state of peace need to be brought? Well, John 3, 36, we all know it well. If you don't believe, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Before you got saved, the literal wrath of God abideth on you. It, it rested on you. And when you got saved, that, that was appeased. That was appeased. That was, that was covered. It was that, that became a state of peace that wrath. Okay? Before you believed you had that wrath on you, after you don't. So look, if there's a distinction between sins before and after you became Catholic, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. Okay, so you have to, you have to just say, I believe extra biblical stuff. I believe catholicwebsite.com over the Bible. All right, go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, the last book of your Bible, Revelation chapter 1, in verse number 5. I mean, just think of this. I mean, just think of this. I mean, they're, they're saying that there's a distinction, you know, it, it's nowhere found in the Bible. It's all sins, the sins of the world. Look at Revelation 1, 5. The Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's like, no, but he only washed like the lower uh, part of the rear tire of the car. The rest of the car is dirty. You're going to have to wash the rest of the car for the rest of your life. I mean, look, that is blaspheming the blood of Christ. That is blaspheming. I mean, that's why, like, that's why, like, it's not in the Bible anywhere. That's why in Proverbs 24, 9, it says, I mean, think about this. If you had to cover your own sins with confession, think about how confusing this would be. I mean, what if you missed one? I mean, what if you, what if you missed a sin? I mean, the Bible says that in Proverbs 24, the thought of foolishness is sin. Can you even, I mean, I guarantee if I had you write down all your sins, you would miss a lot of them that you probably didn't even know were, were sins. You know, thoughts that you've had, things that you left, you know, that you didn't do, that you should have done. But look, the Lutherans, the Lutherans try to get around this. Okay, I'm going to read you something from the Lutheran divine service that the Lutherans would chant every week. Okay, the, the Lutherans will, they, they have some pretty interesting wording here that tries to cover all the things that they've forgotten with this thing that you repeat. 
right? It's a vain repetition. It, they repeat this. They say, most merciful God. Every Sunday morning, they will say this. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you as our, with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. See, they cover the two main commandments right there. They cover the, you know, love the Lord and love your neighbor. All commandments go underneath those, right? We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. All right, so look. Is that really confessing your sins to the Lord right there? I mean, think about that. I mean, talk about magical prayer time. You know, if I just say this magical thing, and, and, tr and we would all just sit there every single Sunday, and we'd be like, Lord, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone, and what, where are we at? And, you know, that's, that's and you're just like, when's church over? I mean, that, it's just the whole church service is a vain repetition. And the reason that the Bible says, you know, not to do vain repetitions is because it means nothing to both God and the person saying it. It means nothing. I mean, think about Think about if Saul, we talked about King Saul this morning. Think about if King Saul would have, you know, he would have been in rebellion to the Lord. He would have been just not admitting that he had, he had committed fault against the Lord. And he, and he would still be in, in that rebellious heart, but he just would have chanted that magical prayer or that magical saying. Do you think that that would have done any good? Of course not. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 and look at verse number 7. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 7. King Saul was in rebellion. And some magical words that just are designed to cover everything wouldn't change the fact that his heart was in rebellion to the Lord. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 and look at verse number 7. It says that when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. So the Bible says that who does vain repetitions? The heathen. And it says, well, why not do vain repetitions? Maybe that's something that the heathen do that's a good idea. Well, it explains why. It says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. It says, look, they're not going to be heard. Vain repetitions are not going to be heard. Period. Okay? So, the Bible says vain repetitions are not going to be heard. So, I mean, you shouldn't do them because they don't mean anything. All right? Look, confession has nothing to do with salvation, folks. All right, has nothing to do with salvation. But look, it is a good thing. It is a good thing. So I'm going to explain to you why it's a good thing. Confession is an act of reconciliation. It's an act of reconciliation. Think of a friend. I mean, just think of an example here. Think of a friend who did you wrong. You know, think of a friend who did you wrong. The Bible says that you are to just forgive your friend. Right? Forgiveness. Like, forgiveness for you, Christian, is supposed to be a one-way street. It doesn't necessarily mean your friend has to come to you and make everything right. You're supposed to just forgive them. You know, let not the sun go down on your wrath. The Bible says you're just supposed to forgive your brothers and sisters, period. But look, think of a friend who did you wrong. They say they stole $100 from you. They say they stole 100 bucks from you, and the Bible says let it go, suffer yourself to be defrauded, the whole thing. But look, that person that did you wrong in order to reconcile that relationship, I mean, they should confess that. They should confess that to you. Like, I'm sorry, I, I stole $100 from you. I mean, that will, you know, completely reconcile that relationship. I mean, I'm sorry I stole the money. You know, here's the money back. You know, it's about the relationship, folks. It's about the relationship. Thank God the Bible doesn't just tell us how to get saved. It tells us how to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen. You know, so we don't have to stumble through this Christian life, just getting beating after beating after beating after beating and going like, what's going on? You know, why is this happening this way? That's what the Bible is talking about when it talks about confessing our sins. It's about having that relationship. It's about being at peace with our Heavenly Father. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. So just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're, you're living a loving relationship towards the Lord, folks. Okay? Look, Let's look at some application here. Let's look at how this can affect our lives, how we can put this into practice. And let's talk about, you know, admitting fault in your life. I mean, it's a big deal. You know, it's, a, it's something that not very many people are good at, actually. 
you know, both in the secular world and amongst, you know, godly saved Christians. Unfortunately, so look, and, and most people aren't good at failure. Most people aren't good at admitting fault because they're just not good. They don't know how to handle failure. Okay, now look, I, I remember, you know, going to college and being in college, and I remember especially the first year or two, I was really surprised at how many, like, straight-A students just dropped out of college. They, they just couldn't handle failure. They couldn't handle getting a D. They couldn't handle getting a C. You know, I was really good at getting Ds. I was awesome at it. <laughs> My wife saw my college transcript a few years ago, and she's like, how did they give you a degree? I'm like, okay, that's not what this, is, this sermon's about. But how did you graduate? No, I'm just, C's get degrees, honey. That's what I said. Yeah. All right. Anyway, no, that's not the sermon, and that's not what I'm do good in school. Kids, don't listen to me right now. All right. How to handle failure. Okay, the Bible tells us here, there's a couple points that I want to give you on how to handle two ways here, two ways to fail properly. How's that sound? All right. The first thing is this. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. You think, think about David. All right, think about David. I mean, David, I mean, when you think about David, do you think good or do you think bad in the Bible? Most people think good. You know, King David, wow, good king, best king. You know, most people think it's the best thing ever. All right, you know, talking about David. So here's the thing, 2 Samuel chapter 12, David made a lot of really bad mistakes. So why in the world are people so positive about David. I mean, look, David made so many mistakes in the Bible and such big mistakes that they're mistakes that most of you, I hope, I pray, will never make. Okay, I mean, murder, adultery, terrible mistakes. Okay, but the, the difference with David is this. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 13. This is right after David has committed adultery, he has murdered Uriah, I mean, he's, I mean, he's murdered several people, okay, because not only Uriah died, all right, there was a battle, he sent Uriah into battle, a bunch of people got killed, Uriah got killed too, that was the goal, okay, so David just murdered people over, you know, to cover up some sins that he had, Nathan comes to him, he tells the story about the poor man and the sheep, and, you know, David still doesn't really get it, and then Nathan the prophet says, thou art the man. He just says right to his face, it's you, it's you, buddy, it's you that did it. And right away, as soon as Nathan is done talking, this is what David says. Remember what Saul said this morning? Remember what Saul said? This is what David said. Immediately after Nathan the prophet closes his mouth, David says, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. See how fast that reconciliation happened? Amen. Just like that. David said, I've sinned against the Lord. He just confessed his sin. Right away. He just, as soon as he found out that Nathan was talking about him, I've sinned against the Lord. Go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, look at verse number 22. There's other places in the Bible, we'll look at it in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Acts chapter 13, verse 22, the Bible says this about David. See, the difference between David and Saul and David and you and David and whoever else and the reason that David was way up here with the Lord was Acts 13 22. In Acts 13 22 the Bible says and when he had removed him he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave their testimony and said I have found David the son of Jesse who a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will. David was constantly seeking after the Lord. Look, he messed up a lot along the way. So you sit there and you're like, yeah, you know what? I've messed up a lot in my life. Yeah, big deal. So it's, I mean, it is a big deal. Don't get me wrong. Don't go mess up tomorrow and say, Brother Jared said you could. But I mean, the point is that David messed up a lot in his life, but he was constantly seeking the Lord. His heart was towards the Lord. He still had the flesh, just like we do. But his heart was towards the Lord. He was after God's heart. I mean, he was far from perfect. He made huge mistakes in the Bible. But what made him great was his heart towards the Lord and his ability and his willingness in his heart to get things right with God and to have that good relationship. So look, if you can't admit fault, if you can't admit sin, here's the thing. You know, you have a heart problem. There's something wrong with your heart and you will suffer for it. If you can't admit sin in your life, you will suffer. And more specifically from the Bible, from Proverbs 24, you will not prosper. 
you will not prosper. I mean, being in sin, I mean, I mean, let me just give you some perspective from, from you know, being up here preaching for a year. I mean, you'll see, you'll, you'll preach a sermon, and, you know, people that you weren't even really thinking about when, you know, you preach the sermon or whatever will just come up and they'll be like, man, that really got me thinking. And, and I just, I just, I, I've got to change that and all this. And yeah, I've just, thank you for the message. And I'm just like, I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking that that would have, you know, about you when I wrote that sermon. And then you'll, you know, the people that, you know, maybe you were thinking about when you wrote that sermon, just right over their head. These people exist. They're, they're among us. They're here. Right? So look, this will mean you don't prosper if you can't admit the sin in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh, them shall have mercy, the Bible says. So, you know, the opposite... The opposite of somebody that confesses their sin is somebody that covers their sin. These are your people that make excuses all the time for stuff, right? They're, you know, by the way, excuses are never believable. Just stop doing it. Everybody in the world. No, nobody believes excuses. Let me give you an example. You know, give me an example. Let's, let's, let's talk about something that happens all the time. Being late for work, all right? Let's say you're late for work. Look, here's the thing. It's going to happen. You're going to be late for work one time. It's happened to everybody. But you don't go in and make excuses. Nobody wants to hear it. You go in and say, it's my fault. I'm sorry. Where do, where do I go? Where do, where do I start? That's what you do. You know, and look, because that, and look, that right there, that one thing right there, that will distinguish you. Because everybody else goes in and they make all kinds of excuses about why they were late or why they did something wrong or whatever. Look, I mean, people have this misguided idea that everyone expects them to be perfect. That's not the case. Nobody expects you to be perfect. They do expect you to not be a liar, though. You know, that's one thing that they do expect. They do expect you to not make excuses, not be lazy, and not be a liar. Look, I mean, here's the bottom line. I mean, on this one silly little example, if you work somewhere for a year or more, you're going to be late one time. You're going to be late. But by the way, some of you should try working somewhere a year or more. Some of you change jobs like I change socks. Work somewhere for a year, and you're going to be late. Okay, my wife said to me the other day, I was talking to the kids or something. I just rabbit trailed this thing for a second. I was talking to the kids, and I was just like, here's, here's the problem. Here's what we're going to do to fix it, and all this. My wife said something to me like, she's like, well, you're just kind of, you're just sort of harsh sometimes. And, you know, she was just telling me, but let me tell you something about me. Okay, let's take a poll in the church right now, all right? And the women can, that you can... You can't say anything. You have to be silent in the church. But you can, per you can participate in the poll. Everybody likes polls now, right? All we do is look at polls. Let's take a poll. All right. How many people want to be a loser? How many people want to raise failures for kids? How many people want to, you know, just fail at everything that they do? How many people want to get fired from every job they ever have? I don't see any hands. That's why, so look, this, when I'm coming at you with stuff, it, it's coming from a good place. Because I, I don't want you to fail at everything. I want you to understand the, the world that we're living in and what the Bible says about how to get through that. All right? So look, I mean, you're going to be late one time. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to go to work. You're going to start a new job. And you're going you're gonna to mess stuff up. You're going to break things. You know, you're going you're gonna to wreck things because you didn't know what you were doing. It, and just, it's just going to happen. Don't make excuses. Just say, you know what? I, 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 I realize that. Look, look at, you ever play hot potato? It's like this. Mistakes and failures are like hot potato. Okay? And here's what most people do. Hot potato, you're throwing a... I've never actually played it with an actual potato. Has anyone? But anyway, you're throwing a ball around and you have to get rid of the ball as fast as possible. Right? These people, I mean, imagine a, a, just a steaming hot potato and you're playing this game and you're passing it around and you want to get rid of it as fast as possible. These people that won't admit mistakes are like these people that just grab the potato and just hold it there. And some tiny little thing, like being late for work or wrecking some small thing or whatever, just turns into this massive burn wound on their hand. 
it just melts through their hand because they turn them they just lose all credibility they they just look just as soon as you admit fault just drop that thing immediately just confess it immediately man I'm, I mean I'm really good at this as soon as I, I mean you let go of these things immediately you're like I messed up drop it just like that like I'm, I mean what are people gonna do like I messed up there's no excuse for it I messed up what are you gonna do to me I don't say the last part but there's nothing they can do right I mean you're gonna distinguish yourself because most people won't do that it's weird I don't know I think people used to do that or, or try to blame others that's even worse I mean, now, I mean, you just wreck your reputation with everybody. I mean, the potato just burns them. They end up in the hospital from the potato. It's crazy. You could take something like a stupid mistake and have it just ruin your entire reputation. Just confess it. You know, you're making yourself a liar if you don't. Think of it that way. I mean, that's, I mean how many times did it say, you know, you make him a liar, you make yourself a liar. Look, you get, if you don't confess your sins, you're going to make yourself a liar. Even in, in the world we live in today. And the second point is this. So first of all, just admit it right away. Admit your fault. The second point is this. You fix the problem moving forward. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And look down at verse number 47. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 47. The Bible says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him will they ask the more. So it's saying, look, if you know, if you know what to do and you don't do it, you're going to be beaten with a lot of stripes. I mean, that's you. That's you as you sit and you listen and you read the Bible and you learn what God says and then you don't do it. That's you. Amen. Two things, look, two things will get you fired at work. All right? Lying and covering your mistakes will get you fired at work. And then here's the second one and the one I want to point out. Making the same mistakes over and over again will get you fired at work. All right? I mean, look, who would want somebody like that working for them? Think about it. Who would want somebody like that working for them that just keeps making the same mistake again and again and again? Because you know what that means? It means you can't learn. It means you have the inability to learn. I mean, if you sit here and you listen to preaching again and again and again and again and you just don't get it, it's like you're just going to be beaten with a lot of stripes in your life. You're just going to be beaten again. Now, look, I don't want to watch that. Who wants to watch that? Who wants to watch a brother or sister in Christ just get beaten in their life? and chastise, again, in their life. Look, there's three ways to learn. Here's the three ways to learn. All right, the first way to learn is by listening to wise counsel. That's one way, that's, I mean, that's the best way to learn. The second way to learn is to learn from the mistakes of other people. Look, that, these, number one and number two are pretty good ways to learn, okay? Number three is make your own mistakes. Look, you wanna do number one or number two. You wanna either, Listen to wise counsel and learn that way, or watch other people fall on their face and be like, okay, I don't want to step in that same spot. I mean, that works too. All right, but look, you must, you, if you insist that you're like, no, I want to make my own mistakes. You're like, no, I, I insist on just stepping in that hole and falling on my face myself. Then look, here's the thing. You gotta learn from that mistake then. You gotta learn from that mistake because learning things the hard way and then repeating it and then learning it again and then repeating it and then learning it again and then repeating it, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's not gonna work for you in your spiritual life. It's not gonna work for you in your Christian life. It's not gonna work for you in your, in your secular job or at home with your kids or anything. I mean, just think about this. People raising kids and they just won't do it the Bible way. I mean, they just won't do it the Bible way. And, and I just feel like when you see situations like that, I feel like you're watching someone beat their head against a brick wall, and then they come to you and say, my head hurts. And I'm like, well, you're beating your head against the wall. And they're like, yeah, but my head hurts. And they go beat their head against the wall again. I mean, this is people that just can't learn. So look, it's about learning from your mistakes. So you admit your fault, and you, you fix the problem, right? That, and that, look, that will fix your relationships with everybody in this church, and that will fix your relationships with your Heavenly Father. 
which is what 1 John 1, 9 is about. It's about just having a good relationship with your heavenly Father, period. Confession is a good thing. Confession is a good thing. Turn to James chapter 5. It's about admitting fault, fixing it going forward. There's nothing in the Bible tying it to salvation. It, I mean, it's just a great path to good relationships. It makes sense, right? With your brothers and sisters as well. Look at James chapter 5. Look at James chapter 5 and verse number 16. James chapter 5, 16. The Bible says this. Talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. James, the book of James is about, is about what? It's about how to do your religion, right? I mean, look, you're saved. Now, how do I do this thing? It wasn't, it wasn't my doing that got me here, but how do I do it? It's like, I'm, I'm 43, I've got how many years left to live? I hope a lot, maybe not, who knows? But how do I do the rest of my years? James, that's your book for you. Look at James 5.16. The Bible says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may heal, be healed. The effect, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Look, this is talking about, look, this isn't talking about like sitting down and having you, having you tell me like every sin you've ever committed in your life. I mean, that, that's some weird stuff right there. Amen, yeah. I mean, who would ever want to do that? You have to be a psychopath to want that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to be some kind of sicko yeah. to be like, oh no, every, every one of you, you got to come tell me every single bad thing you've ever done <laughs> every single week. I mean, you got to be some kind of sicko. Yeah. Straight up, it's weird. Yeah. I mean, is that not strange? I mean... I mean, when you look at this stuff from the outside, you're like, what in the world? You know, you walk by these Catholic churches, they must be $100 million to build some of these things. Yeah. I mean, and they, they're just like, they're listening to all this stuff. This weird, weird doctrine. Look, this is talking about the 100 bucks. This is what this is talking about. It's like, I stole 100 bucks from Frank. I should confess that to him. It's like, hey, man, I'm sorry I stole 100 bucks from you. Here's 100 bucks. I'm sorry. Like, I, you know, no excuse. No excuse. I stole your money. I'm sorry. It's, that's, it, that, that's it. I mean, how many of you here think that if you stole 100 bucks from Frank and then you paid him back and you just confessed your fault to him, that Brother Frank would be like, get out of here, brother. I hate you. I mean, look, it works. You know what I mean? I mean, this is advice that works. I mean, this stuff will fix your relationships. And most importantly, it'll fix your relationship with God. So, you know, if, if you're holding something back that you know that, you know, you're stuck on and you don't want to admit that's wrong and you're just hung up on this thing, you're hard-hearted about it, look, that's gonna, you're not going to prosper. You're not right. You're not right. Look, you're not not saved. Okay, you're not not saved, but you're not right. Raise your hand if you want to prosper. Hello? I mean, come on. You know, that is the key. Is just just for just forget it. Have that same humility that you had when you got saved, and just be like, you know what? I've been, I've been, I've been holding back in this area, and I've been not listening to God in this area. And listen, if you're sitting in this church, you know, you know where you're holding back, and you know where your heart is hard, and you know what the problems are in your life. Confess those to the Lord. Get over that and move forward. That's what this is about. That's the whole point of this church. Look, if you're not going to admit your sin, if you're not going to admit your sin, you're not going to get right, please let me know so I can just stop spending so much time doing this. Because, I mean, really, it, it's a waste of my time to preach to somebody who's not going to get right. Yeah. I mean, confess your faults to one another. Fix your relationships with each other. You got problems with each other, fix it. Both sides. Somebody wrongs you, suffer yourself to be defrauded. That's how you fix that side. The other person, confess your faults. That's it. I mean, is it, I mean this isn't rocket surgery. We're not building a space shuttle here. You know, this is, I mean, the space shuttle was a terrible idea, by the way. I mean, like, one in ten exploded. I mean, hello? Who thinks that's a good program? Okay, not the point of the sermon. All right, but look, here's the thing. Putting confession into salvation is confusing, it's terrible, it's keeping people from getting saved, and it's just about us saved people having a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. It's very simple. I mean, what in the world was he talking about with the simplicity of the gospel if it would be this complicated thing? When people start talking to you about these complicated things, you just got to reject it right away. 
All right, confession, a good thing tainted by bad doctrine. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.